Hi, everyone here and around the world in this difficult time of more human violence bursting in Israel and Gaza, along with the persistent war in Ukraine. And now a new medical study has found, quote, gun deaths rising sharply among children, published last week in the journal Pediatrics. Until now, car accidents caused the most child deaths. But according to an analysis published on Thursday, October 5, 2023, the rate of firearm fatalities among children under 18 increased by 87 percent from 2011 through 2021 in the United States. The death rate attributable to car accidents fell by almost half, leaving firearm injuries the top cause of accidental death in children, close quote. Beyond Troubled Earth, NASA and SpaceX tomorrow morning, October 12, 2023, at 1060 a.m. daylight time, they will launch from Kennedy Space Center with a science mission called Psyche. You can watch the launch tomorrow, Thursday, beginning at 930 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on NASA TV at nasa.gov forward slash NASA TV. The name Psyche comes from the Greek word, which means the soul, mind, spirit, or invisible animating entity which occupies the physical body. The Psyche mission is headed for a puzzling metallic object in our solar system called 16 Psyche. 16 Psyche orbits in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter and got its name for being the 16th minor planet in order of discovery in our Earth's solar system. 16 Psyche's orbit averages about 280 million miles from the Sun, and the Psyche spacecraft won't get to the strange metal world until August of 2029. Scientists have never seen a body in our solar system before that has largely a metallic surface. The Psyche metal asteroid is 144 miles long and 173 miles wide and is made up of platinum, nickel, iron, and gold. And Forbes estimates its value at $10 quadrillion. One quadrillion is equal to a million billion. The puzzle is, where did the metal asteroid come from? Is it the leftover core of an evolving planet that was somehow stripped of its outer rocky shell? Six years from now, in August 2029, hopefully without any problems, the Psyche spacecraft will reach the 16 Psyche asteroid and start unraveling its metallic mysteries. Meanwhile, back on Earth, there are the many other mysteries related to outer space and specifically the many humans who describe interactions with non-human beings face to face or in vivid dreams. Two weeks ago from my September 27th Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast, I asked this question. Is there an avatar soul link between some humans and ETs? That question first came up when I was writing my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, in the early 1990s. That's when some UFO abductees were sketching clear glass tubes with light shining from the top and bottom onto tall, blonde-haired, tall, black-haired, tall, red-haired, tall, brown-haired, and some shorter human bodies, seemingly all in suspended animation in these preservation tubes. One female abductee was told she would undergo, quote, translation into the light, close quote. One short, five-foot-tall human female abductee named Juana Lawson from New Jersey had experienced transference into a tall, thin, female, white-skinned, black-haired humanoid body preserved in a clear glass tube. I ask her, what did the tall ETs want to accomplish? Juana answered, quote, they wanted to take a sub-creature 
and evolve it to the level that they are on and prove it could be done. But why? To prove that what is not pure and good could be made pure and good. So is the soul the major challenge? Are tall beings inserting the experimental preserved bodies with souls? Juana answered, quote, no, with their genes, taking from themselves and putting their genes into the fetuses of the human entity. Each time you do that, you get a higher evolution to teach love, unity, oneness with this conscious universe, close quote. In our discussions in the early 1990s, Juana Lawson stressed that the tall extraterrestrials genetically experimenting on Earth say, quote, There are many humans that are positive. We will try to pick them up before Earth has destructions from nuclear weapons that can have a devastating effect on other dimensions and the entire galaxy, close quote. Those words were from an interview that I did in the early 1990s. Ten years later, by 2002, military and aerospace whistleblowers began to talk about another tall, very advanced humanoid group described to be white as chalk from hair to feet. Referred to as tall whites, one retired aerospace engineer told me that, quote, without the tall whites' protection, we homo sapien would not have survived this long, close quote. So why haven't we been officially introduced to the tall whites publicly? And why haven't the tall whites shown up in the abductee illustrations of different tall humanoids that have black, red, brown, or blonde hair preserved in those clear preservation tubes? But since that recent September 27th Earth Files broadcast, I have received one man's experience with what seemed to be tall whites supervising his unconscious placement in some kind of clear container. This report by a 46-year-old producer of meditation music evolved from a confusing memory that haunts him to this day. The year was 2010. He was 33 years old, living in Minnesota. One day, he was experimenting with his guitar and keyboard to produce new meditation music. Suddenly, he found himself waking up behind what he thought was a clear glass window in a tube or a rectangle under the control of two very tall, identical male beings, the color of white chalk from head to toe. I think around then I started to learn how to meditate, being kind of amazed by how it can really help. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to sit back on my chair and meditate for a minute. And I just popped right into <laughs> wherever it was. What were you seeing? Well, I woke up inside whatever it was. All of a sudden, I was in a tube or in a box, and there was a rectangular window sort of thing. Like, I was looking through this window right in front of my face, and I saw two beings in front of me over a large console and they were both doing something on this they seemed taller than me and i'm six foot the room was very white very stark clean feeling and the one on the right turned around noticed i was awake or something and i just energetically felt an urgency like you're not supposed to see this like you're not supposed to be here you're not supposed to be awake. Go back to sleep feeling. Mm -hmm. He quickly turned around and walked towards me and as quick as he could put me back to sleep. <laughs> uh, By doing what? He did the hand wave thing. Okay, explain what you were seeing. About 15 feet in front of me. The one on the right, he turned around. All of a sudden, I felt like I woke up. Like I was just waking up and I was like looking through this window. What's going on in here? Where am I? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I'm looking through this rectangular window or something, and he swung around 180 degrees. His eyes locked into mine, and I got this energetic impression like, why are you awake? And then he quickly waved his hand. His forearm moved 
but no. Towards you? Side to side. It was like one time. He moved the lower part of his arm like a windshield wiper? Yes, yes. And then what did you feel when his arm moved like a windshield wiper? And what happens? Yeah, so he moved his arm from one side to the other. And then I just felt this, I guess, energetically. It felt I could compare it to like a gust of wind. And then I was back to my normal self. But I felt kind of this... Are you still in the tube and are they still outside together, those two? I was back awake. But where are you back awake? In the basement at my house. Okay, so now you're in the basement of your house. What happens? I was really confused. I didn't quite know what that was all about. It felt real. It felt so real. If I'm understanding, just by waving his hand at you, you went unconscious again. Yeah, I snapped out of whatever. I just kind of came back into the basement. (laughs) So describe in detail these beings that have that kind of control over you. Yeah, I remember them being male. They were very tall, very skinny, stark white. Their faces just seemed to look the same, looked very similar to each other, like similar height, almost like they were clones from what I remember. How tall and what were they wearing? I just remember all white, and they seemed very tall and wispy. The the tube or whatever I was in, it felt like I was standing upright. They felt taller than me. As if you were in a tube or a box in a tube that was vertical. You're six foot tall. The tube you're in might be a little bit taller than that, but you're looking at two beings that are essentially white from their hair, face, clothes, and they look the same? Yeah. I remember their faces. I remember they were wearing clothes, but it was very minimalist. I just remember seeing a lot of white colors. Like wearing a leotard to cover the body, but not clothes as we think of clothes? Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like a one-piece sort of thing. It wasn't like a traditional thing we would put on on earth. (laughs) Their faces, what would you compare their faces to in terms of human faces? Very white. I thought Nordic. I just thought they were like albinos, really tall albinos. Because they were all white, including their hair. Yeah. And you were not seeing blonde hair. I don't distinctly remember seeing blonde hair. The albino comes up because that is the one word that humans know when all color, the hair, the face, everything is white. And that's why it's important to know the albino impression that you have is because they were all white. Yeah. The color of the eyes. Silver, kind of bluish, grayish, silver. Because they sort of glowed. Yeah. I never really knew what to think of this. You're talking to somebody who has interviewed a lot of people, and there are tall whites. And the tall whites are supposed to be spiritual and supposed to be allies of humans. Not many people have a close-up with the tall whites. Have you had any vivid dreams about either or both of those tall whites since? I haven't. I've had dreams where I've like shot up into a spacecraft and there's other kinds of beings. Holy crap, I didn't know there's this much variety out there. Another UFO abductee nearly 30 years ago also saw clear transparent tubes and rectangles encasing many different races and ages of Earth humans. She was Betty Andresen Luca, the subject of UFO investigator Raymond Fowler's several books about the 1979 Andresen Affair and the 1990s Watchers. In 1996, when I was working on my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, I met and talked with Betty and her husband, Bob Luca, about their perspectives of the non-humans. Betty sent me this illustration that she did of, quote, the people of all races and times encased in clear rectangular receptacles for preservation by the non-human beings that she called the watchers. 
who have monitored the earth for thousands, millions of years. Betty said mankind is destroying much of nature and the beings are telling her that they're doing this because the human race will become sterile by the pollution and the bacteria and the terrible things that are on the earth. They said they're watchers and tall elders and they keep seed from man and woman from earth so the human form won't be lost. The balance of nature, all nature, including man, is in jeopardy, close quote. Betty also stressed, quote, everything in nature has a plus and a minus, a light and dark, a negative and positive, a good and bad. It must be for without some content of evil, there can be no good, there can be no growth. We do not need evil for good, we need choice. The Creator gave us choice. We cannot use that choice unless we have two choices to make, evil or good. Evil on this dimensional plane must exist." Close quote. Betty also said, the extraterrestrial watchers and tall elder ETs she encountered told her that they created the gray biological caretakers or artificial intelligent androids to be remote imaging surrogates connected to the tall elders with bioelectric mind projections. Betty asked, quote, what if humans are serving a similar purpose now as remote imaging surrogates for very advanced beings, but with free will to choose good or evil, close quote. Betty wondered if the purpose for homo sapien creation on earth might have served a multi-level agenda, a test experiment to unite the divine spirit with primitive animals as one Lawson described, and to use the petri dish of planet Earth to test new hybrid creatures while the experimental humans did work for the elder watchers, such as mining and building pyramids, ziggurats, and temples as communication machines. In the elder programs to harvest information from human souls, minds, and bodies, and from other earth life, and perhaps even for use in different timelines and survival needs of time travelers. Maybe, like political factions, the dark party and the light party are competing over legislation to legalize the production of cloned android life outside the force of creation's recycling program of a finite number of souls. Maybe some souls are captured and put into clone bodies, which is fouling up God's process. Do clones receive souls? If there is a finite number of souls under a strictly regulated God force soul recycling program, then clone bodies and androids might end up outside that recycling reincarnation force. The full scope of the game board for souls, spirits, and bodies of humans, extraterrestrials, angels, time travelers, other dimensionals, might be beyond human ability to understand. One scientist in New England, who has also been abducted by gray beings, who repaired his heart told me that he was shown holograms that depicted a series of universes in pairs, mirrored images, each the opposite of the other, from the subatomic to the macro. And he told me, quote, our universe is paired to another one, which is completely opposite of this one. There, the skies are glowing white with dark suns, colors are indescribable and iridescent, and time flows to the past. Like a conveyor belt, at the moment of death in our universe, we move through a tunnel into the mirror universe where it is all light. There, time moves to the past and souls again 
return back here, close quote. Now, in this time of revolution, when the whole world will know we are not alone in this universe, our greatest challenge as a species will be to stand up unafraid before the old lords and watchers. Ultimately, there is a common bond among all life forms ebbing and flowing on spirals of different frequencies supported by a singular force an invisible matrix of energy from which everything emerges and to which everything returns. And I want to thank all of you who are here tonight in this very difficult time on earth. And Ian, I would like to know what questions and comments we have from viewers tonight to share. Well, good morning, good evening. Good, good evening, Linda. We've got a lot of people in the chat that talked about the tubes already. Uh, I wanted to just make a reference. You referenced Betty, Andreas, and Luca. Uh, I was at TCCHE conference in London over the weekend, and I was asked what, which one was my favorite UFO um, story of all time. And I thought for a moment, and I thought, yes, that one was probably one of my favorites. Yeah. And I know that the, 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 the section about the tubes is riveting. So I, I would recommend anything you want to refer back to Raymond Fowler's, I think, five books on the subject. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a good place to start on, on some of this stuff. Right. And the uh, issue that intrigues me is that I never encountered anything about uh, the tubes at all until I started doing the work in the early 1990s. And these half a dozen people that are in my Glimpses Volume 2 came to me and each one, they didn't know each other at all, but they were drawing and sketching exactly the same kind of tubes with either humans and or a variety of non-humans inside of them, uh, sustained by light, and that the uh, issue of when that one, uh, uh, that phrase that we put up on the screen, when a praying mantis uh, had come into one of the rooms where Linda Porter and my book was waiting and didn't know what was going to happen. And the praying mantis seemed to have some higher pecking order among uh, the smaller ones there, may have been a peer of the talls, but said to Linda Porter, I'm going to translate, you will be translated in the light. And she did not understand what that meant. Other people who have had these transfers in tubes, they do not understand that phrase. And I'm very curious among our viewers tonight, are there any of you who have had any interactions with any of the tubes as you have seen drawn uh, by Juana Lawson and the other people that are in Glimpses of Other Realities Volume 2? because there must be something pivotal, something really, really crucial about starting with the Brian in the interview that I was able to at least highlight some of his experience and that how long have preservation tubes been being used with people who are taken from the earth and put in them for who knows what length of time or why? And is it all geared around the moment of transition from life, and instead of saying life to death, life to another dimensional, other universe experience? It's the ultimate question, Ian. And it haunts every human, I think, now because we are on such a rocky uh, planet. And what is the relationship of all of the tall, advanced ETs to their experiments on our planet and other planets and a recycling program that includes the recycling of souls in those who have them? 
to answer it, it's whether or not it, it's becoming more and more apparent that there is something going on very important about these tubes. And we need to know what this is. And I've seen what the triggering effect is of the tubes, abductees seeing a picture of the tubes and having a recollection of their own experiences. So it is something that's very significant. And so, yes, we'll leave it open to our audience to contact us and uh, give us any information that they've got about being in these tubes. I did want to mention that one thing here that someone's just put uh, in the chat. They said, a blood bank manager told me years ago about scientific papers discussing B negative blood types being hybrids. I did find that to be true in scientific studies. I'm B second rarest. Right. Uh, long ago, when I was doing, um, gosh, this goes back to coast to coast uh, with Art, with Art Bell. And uh, he and I had had a long discussion about the Shroud of Turin and the implication of studies by a lab such as uh, Bell Labs or uh, JPL or a variety of people who would have access to uh, high quality scientists and analyses. And I started reading and one of the, at that time, this would have been uh, definitely in the 1990s, I was also working with Dr. John Altshuler on animal mutilations. He was a, a MD, pathologist and hematologist. Uh, blood work was what he uh, excelled at. And one night he called me up and said, I'd like to have you come over and take a look at a section that I have found, and it was a book. He had been looking for a specific hematology book that went into uh, various parts of the world where there were various blood types. And he showed me and that the, the strongest AB negative, which he himself had concluded from studying something related to the JPL study, that, that the blood or the red or the brown on the Shroud of Turin, as I understand it, if anybody has any other evidentiary material, please uh, contribute it to me. And it's my understanding that in the Shroud of Turin, when they did sophisticated tests, that they were confirming a hemoglobin that would have been in a minus AB negative. I discussed that with Dr. Outschuler. He had not done the tests himself. It was from reading these tests. Well, now, so we started this discussion about minus AB negative. Art and I had talked about it. Uh, I had done a show uh, with some of the people who had been doing some research in turn uh, talking with Dr. Alshuler. And then there came, uh, and I, I remember it was a, a convergence of a lot of people interested in the human abduction side. And one of the, apparently one of the challenges was to, to gather data on people who were abductees who had gone to MUFON or other areas and to try to find out uh, blood, what were their blood types. And I don't have an official document, but I do remember having a discussion with someone then about that AB negative was perhaps higher in the abduction uh, population than non-abductees. Well, if you go out to the big, big picture, that Betty Andresen and Linda Porter and others in Glimpses Volume 2 and all of the work that Betty Andresen did with Ray Fowler. There is uh, this constant challenge of realizing that there are common denominators among some of the people who are abducted and you begin to learn that a lot of them are at least they're a blood negative. And this keeps leading to the question, are they looking for specific homo sapien to abduct? Or is it as implied in the statement in my presentation tonight, 
or are they people that are looked at as positive and they are abducted and then there is some kind of tweaking, some genetic manipulation that is being done through bloodlines, through genetic lines, with a goal, at least from the voices tonight and in previous uh, discussions that I've had with Betty Andresen and others, is it if we knew the whole truth, would we be cheering on an effort to evolve humanity with genetic manipulation by these advanced beings? I don't personally have a clear answer in myself to that question. What bothers me to my core, if the tall whites have been working on this planet for millennia, along with others, in an experiment trying to take a Homo erectus two million years ago in Africa, and then begin genetic manipulation in which eventually they would be producing humanoids, that they would then do genetic manipulation from their own sperm and eggs in this contest, so to speak, to create an advanced and evolved species. Then we are kept on the outside which might explain why we have not been told. We are beginning to be like Brian who woke up looking out a rectangle in a glass and didn't know where he was. He didn't know what was in front of him. And in a strange way, all of the human population on earth has been denied even just straightforward data about the fact that, yes, we are on a planet that has had maybe 16, 20 different civilizations from within. If you put a pin right at the center of, the, um, of our solar system and you went out, say, 40 light years, and that there would be 16, 20, 24 civilizations, some of them high civilizations, sophisticated. They can go use Alcubier warp drive. They can move point to point. They can change dimensions. All of the things that the human mind is clearly, in many physicists, that are working along those lines. And we are close, and maybe the tall whites are helping us, and that's the part we don't know that we're making fast improvements. But if we as a population of a manipulated life form by sophisticated life forms that are trying to look for positive and trying to develop bloodlines and genetic lines that would produce good and reasonable life forms, Why should, by now, it all still be hidden? And which part of this complex, multifaceted puzzle is the most dangerous to the power brokers? We're at such a difficult time. What is happening in Ukraine, what is happening in Israel and Gaza, Somehow it feels like any of it could blow up into a bigger event. And I pray every single morning to the thought that dwells in the light to please, please take away the evil frequencies and the deflections that seem to be pulling on this planet in ways that should not be to destroy something about humanity. And it's very confusing and troubling, very confusing and troubling. So 
Ian, at that point, I'm going to now transition. There's been time for you to pick up some comments or questions. And uh, I'd be very interested in people's feedback. Well, uh, we've got a message in the chat this evening from Colleen Caver, who says, I saw the tubes in the late 80s when I was a small child. For two years, I used to be taken where they were pretty often. Can, so. you, can, she, can you hear me and uh, email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com and send me your phone number so we could talk directly? I would appreciate that. Yes, Colleen, please share with us at earthfiles at earthfiles.com. We'd be interested to hear more about that experience. Of course, if anyone else has any yeah. more corroborating experience with the tubes. Linda, I was going to mention to you, do you remember that you reported on your Earthfiles channel, on the uh, Earthfiles website, as one of your Earthfiles reports, that that gentleman came up to you after a conference? Yes. Uh, and he was quite troubled, and he said that he'd seen uh, you inside one of the tubes. That's right. And it's in Glimpses Volume 2, and his drawing uh, is in there, several drawings that he did in Glimpses Volume 2 in this same chapter with Linda Porter and Juana Lawson about the tubes. And I will, uh, just to ex uh, explain to the audience um, how dramatic this was and how traumatized this man was. I can't remember where I was speaking, but it was... Uh, a pretty large conference and uh, a whole bunch of people had come up to the stage to ask me questions and I had moved down because there was another speaker that was going to come on so we'd moved down with a bunch of people to uh, uh, off from the center of the stage we were down on the floor and somebody was asking me a question but I became aware like of energy of something to my right that was really troubled and I turned and there was a man standing there and he was looking at me and when I looked at him he said and and he and he started he, that's right he his hand came up he was going to shake my hand and his hand was shaking like this and I said what's wrong what's wrong and there were other people around, and he says, your shoes, your shoes, I've seen you in those shoes in a tube. That was my first introduction to the tubes. And I had on silver metallic, they were like they were made out of metal. That's what the shoes look like. And he and I, and I believe it was his wife, we went away to, to, so he could talk uh, privately. He was so distraught. And when we sat down and he started pouring out the story, the whole thing is in Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2. Um, he began to shake again so badly. And I remember saying to him, what is it? what is it that is making you shake so badly? And he said, I don't know whether you were dead or alive and we're sitting here at this conference and you were wearing the shoes that I saw. And he said, what are we to them? I've never forgotten the simple words as that man was shaking. What are we to them? Part of my prayer is that if we are in an experiment in a genetic manipulation and that the tall whites are spiritual, that eventually we could come into focus in all of this through a preservation of human population that might be saved by some ETs from an awful war or something that would prove to us that they actually wanted us to survive. 
It's a very strange time all around the earth. I know that we're in time of great transition. Uh, there are so many letters over the last year that have come or emails of people having dreams about what it feels and looks like right now in Israel and Gaza uh, having to do with all of the attacks going back and forth. Is this what is happening now? Is this like a trigger? Is this the starting bell of something that's going to intensify on our whole planet? And we all need help in understanding what exactly is at stake here and what are the possible future actions. And yet, after that House subcommittee hearing by Representative Burchett from Tennessee and hearing from David Grush and the two pilots, it's like, Everything just goes away and there's no inertia and we are, have been in a terrible political situation in the United States. But I guess I would like to ask all of you, do any of you, have you been having any vivid dreams about more fire in buildings that you recognize as here. I'd be interested if anybody has been having those kinds of dreams. And whatever humans can do in talking to each other, sharing about UFOs and ETs and the possibility that something is upon us and which we will need help beyond humanity, we should all know. Now, Good news is that tomorrow, it's fantastic that they are going to launch off to uh, the Psyche and uh, that we're going to be in a very interesting space period of exploration if we just can hold off the anger and the wicked political problems that seem to be trying to take over the planet. So, Ian, what next? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sexy, sexy Sadie is in the uh, chat tonight. She says, question for Linda. If there is intelligent life in the Trappist system, have you heard or have you any idea what species they may be? I've asked and asked and asked. Uh, and this is one of those where I've been given information two years ago. Remember two years ago that Trappist-1 and the middle planet, E1, is a high civilization and that it would, I would be getting more information as we got closer to this announcement that they kept t saying to me two years ago would be in April of 2023. And that period of time passed without too much fanfare of anything, um, but I have heard more from the aerospace source, but more meaningfully from somebody who works at JSOC, uh, the Joint uh, Special Operations Command, and from another person who is on the science side and said, Linda, uh, it, it will ha happen, there will be an announcement. Uh, we know there is a high civilization on the E1 planet in the TRAPPIST-7 uh, planetary system, solar system. And part of the way that everything is going and how unfair it is, what was the first announcement that a scientist gave allegedly from them t uh, doing serious investigation of the TRAPPIST one system looking for signs of life. Well, they went to the planet that was the closest to the sun, hot. Uh, no one had ever suggested that the planet closest to the sun had anything to do with the high civilization information. And they still have not, no one has made a single report on 
the E1, the E1 planet that is right in the middle of the seven. They, they have had a report about the one closest to the sun, and then there was a second planet that I think was the furthest away. Um, so uh, clearly, there is not a high priority on making the announcement to this world of humanity, you're right, you've all been right. No, we're not alone in this universe. And by God, now we're going to start telling you the truth. That's what I've hoped for. So what keeps holding the truth in and going through all of these games and having uh, a House a subcommittee hearing with uh, David Grush and the two pilots and the very next day coming out of the Aero office in the Pentagon was criticism of David Grush. It's like the one hand says, we're going to tell you the truth, and another hand comes in and says, no, you're not. And that is the internecine warfare that is going on in the Pentagon and that region now. And same thing happened with President Eisenhower in the 50s, exactly the same thing, just different timelines and different amount of details. Okay, Ian. <laughs> yeah, um, Linda, I want to get, uh, give a shout out for the Super Chats, but first of all, I'd like to remind everybody that this episode of Earth Files is available as a podcast and all oh, earlier okay. episodes of Earth Files are available via podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. So I want to make that point as well. Yes, after each uh, Wednesday night, the, uh, the, we do go into podcasts and we are delighted that a lot of you really appreciate that. So thank you. Okay, here we go. Uh, Thank you very much tonight for the super chats from Moonbird, Terry D, Christina Ledesma Jimenez, Lorraine Enman Aldred, Val Fortkamp, who's sent two of those, Mark Petrie, Yin Yang Glo, Hard Candy, Jean Carter, Patty London, One R. Lency, and Phil Feist. Thank you very much. And would you ask the chat in and people doing messages, do they, did they find this report that is going a step further from the September 27th, do, do people find this interesting to them even if I don't and no one I know does have all the answers? Is this a report that is worth reporting to you guys? Yes, let us know in the chat. Give us your response to our report this evening. But I also want to mention as well from Tom the Man, who says uh, he's got a question. Somebody said on a different show that nobody is being visited, and these are nothing more. These experiences are nothing more than sleep paralysis, hallucinations. Uh, my question for Linda is: This is more than sleep paralysis, hallucinations, isn't it? I oh, mean, absolutely. We really are encountering visitors at night, aren't we? If you, I could take all of you with me back in time to the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s and the private discussions that I was having with Bud Hopkins and John Mack and Whitley Strieber and dozens of other people who were in the investigation side and the people, all of the hypnosis sessions that I sat in on in a variety of cities and states of people who were uh, largely traumatized by what they were seeing in their mind under hypnosis. And then having deep, I remember one really deep conversation with John Mack at Harvard, who wrote an excellent book. And he came out of his own confusion and being troubled by what was happening to the conviction that the non-human intelligences that are behind the abduction, we'll call it a program, a grid, a laboratory study, a century's evolutionary genetic manipulation. Dr. Mack wrote in, uh, I think, eloquently about why it was important to study the abductions to give an honest ear and eye to the abductees because 
he, like I and others, felt without question that we are at an intersection in a large swath of time. We are at an intersection which, where even though there's conflict, lies, denial, policies of denial, thick, that behind all of the deflections, politically and uh, all of the problems of getting the truth out, there is still the sense that every one of us who have been into this deeply have always had, this is the most important subject that must be brought open publicly to humanity or we end up as some kind of an abused species that was never ever given the respect to be told what it is that the power brokers know and keep from us. And that that was an untenable situation in the discussions that I had with Dr. Mack and Bud Hopkins and others. So whatever is evolving today that is still frustrating, look back at all those decades, really starting uh, in the 50s, in which there were two sides fighting each other and arguing with each other in the government and in science and a lot of places about whether or not the very facts that were clear as anything to all of those, uh, that generation, we're not alone in the universe, advanced technologies are coming here that can do things that we can't even understand, and keep it all from the public until we understand more. Well, 85 years later, it's not fair to keep it from the public. What else, Ian? Well, we had uh, Eddie Cordova, HypnoWolf, in the chat this evening says, I'm a hypnotherapist. I've helped a lot of people with abduction, regression therapy. It's very real. Yeah. Yeah. And very real. Yeah. You know, and if, yeah, you, got, if uh, you want a huge book to read about why it's real and why it's important, uh, everyone from Whitley Strieber to John Mack, John Mack was a psychiatrist, MD at Harvard who got into this out of curiosity and took it very seriously the more he learned. And his, uh, his work, you, John Mack, MD, uh, do a search and try to read everything that he wrote. And he's also very famous as well for the work that he did with his school in uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, the children and the <laughs> landing of the silver UFO. Without question, he, as, as he said, there was a silver craft that came down there. Yeah, Gloria Terry also in the chat says, you know when you've had these experiences that it was not sleep paralysis. You feel their presence and your mind is fully awake. And on the side of the ETs for a moment, it's been argued to me by uh, in these discussions going back into the 90s that the sleep paralysis the blanking the mind, the all of the various things which seem onerous to me would be kind of another step that we would understand if we think about taking our pets to the vets and they go crazy. So that the argument has been made that what humans describe as sleep paralysis and having their minds erased and uh, missing time and all of the things that seem horrible, it could actually have been acts of a strange kindness because they had a priority to keep their study of humans going, but humans were getting stronger and stronger of mind and body in their resistance. So there might have been that kind of meeting that has now produced uh, we'll call it a, a few generations of people who have had face-to-face -face with non-humans. And they know that they were non-humans. Nobody can tell them otherwise because they were living it. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah, you asked the audience if they liked these, uh, these um, 
experiences that you're bringing forward. Jay Moore says, yes, these deeper dives are essential. The unresolved issues serve to show the human race that strange phenomena are probably the norm on this planet. And Spirit of Anu says, it is definitely worth repeating and sharing more. Avi Z, ufologist, artist, says, love these reports. Absolutely worth every second. Good. Well, I'm going to try to uh, keep going deeper and deeper in the difficult subjects uh, as, in, a, in as positive a constructive way in the context of helping you and me to understand it all because it is extremely complex. And we are going through these political muddles in the United States government at a time when it seems important that we should be clearly focused on what is the best way to open up these truths uh, and that there are some scientists who are saying we better get that back door on Mars, meaning we really better get another base for humanity to go to because who knows what is going to happen on Earth. Go ahead, Ian. Okay, I was just uh, watching some of these comments coming in because Tom the Man says, uh, that his experiences, when he had his experiences, he tried to gather evidence, and um, this is in a comment that he had already previously sent to me, but that the comment that the uh, the evidence that he gathered via videotape had disappeared. Uh, so we understand that gathering the evidence for all of this is difficult, but he does say that he was too young to understand what was happening anyway. Well, when uh, all of the military people were threatened that they would lose all military pay and everything. Uh, and that it, part of me, because I do not want to be uh, in an attack mode uh, on any part of this, I want us to be told the truth and then go forward with all the incredible work it will take to understand what I see as our entire history going back through Samaria and back and back, that all of the civilizations that built the pyramids, that built the sphinxes, they were not homo sapiens sapiens. And that is another huge part that uh, needs to be opened up for everything. Eric Von Doniken has been trying. He's even older than I am. I think he's 86 and I'm 81. And we have been trying for such a long time to open up the truths. And we've had people tell us, yes, there were other people from other, just exactly like Robert Temple in the Sirius mystery. Yes, extraterrestrials in the Sirius system were at Mali and they had given information. Well, for the people who are on the inside and can say that, yes, we know, but you haven't included humanity in that knowing. And that's where we are today, which is why I'm doing the Earth Files YouTube channel and hoping that uh, soon, I'm hoping that we will make up the, uh, the what is it, Ian? We have about two or 300 left and we will be at a quarter million even. And uh, right. we would like to, have that happen sooner than later, so we could embrace a lot of you into the Earth Files world. So if you haven't subscribed, click on that subscribe button. And if you uh, like what I'm doing, then click on the like button. And all of those things help us uh, to keep growing, which is part of the reason, a uh, part of the energy that it takes to do with this on a weekly basis is knowing that there's a growing audience and that all of you actually are truly, truly committed to knowing the truth as I am. And that makes me feel good that there is a growing population of people who are uh, not being uh, knocked down psychologically, mentally, spiritually by those that are paid to tell the world there's nothing here go go, do something else, no ETs, no UFOs, no ancient history, no ancient ill. No, that's, that's the part that's wrong. We need to learn about the truth. So 
Ian, is there one more question? Yes, well, Jessica Rodriguez says we need more love and care about everyone. We are yes. all one earth. And yes. just, in, just, turned, just in time, 143 says, what's Linda's greatest hopes for the future of humanity on this planet? That we have a global announcement, all time zones at the same moment. The sun will be down in some places, the night will be out, others mourning that we do this in an orchestrated huge announcement all around the planet in which there will be an introduction if it is the tall whites if they are truly the spiritual uh, i'm going to say planners experimenters that they mean us no harm that we they see how harmful we humans are to each other and that is unfortunately a fact. And that it is hard to believe that humanity has not reached a point where we love each other as fellow beings, not because of hair, not because of skin, not because of eyes, not because of sex, not because of anything that is a complete and weird deflection from what the Greek ETs that were Herodotus, they were actually, I think, something like tall whites. And, and the concept that humanity in the original experiment that Juana Lawson and the others describe in Glimpses Volume 2, very advanced ETs that can move point to point in the universe. Maybe they get bored and they want to know, can we take this very primitive animal in the lands of this place in Earth that has two arms and two legs? And can we genetically manipulate it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and make us meaning whether it's tall whites, Nordics, praying mantises, all involved in this story, in this experiment. Any way you cut it, that which was being manipulated, the genetic evolution to what we are now, which is eight billion people on this planet who should love each other agape. That's the recognition of a fellow being, not sexual intercourse. Love your fellow being because you recognize your humanness in other beings. Have you not wanted to cry and embrace a woman on a sidewalk with a young child and she's holding a cup for some pennies? Have you not felt that overwhelming pressure in the chest that comes when you see people who are unmercifully suffering, no help on streets. To me, that is compassion. And on earth, it seems to me that intelligent compassion is needed more than bullets, more than bombs, more than anything. Serious, human to human compassion. And obviously the political chaos in every country now makes it so difficult. Well, what is it that has wound up all of this political division, the, the right versus the left, instead of what are the problems that we as a nation, we as a world must solve in order for each generation to be able to even have food. Those are the priorities, it seems to me, that the We'll call it the human power brokers 
the ones that are fighting each other in a variety of Congresses that aren't working. I want to hear people cheering for, let's go for happy, loving life on this planet, not just with humans, but with our creatures everywhere. When I read yesterday that there was a river someplace, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it had a hundred and, I think it was 164 dolphin-type creatures. They all died at once. And when the scientists who were so puzzled came, the temperature on the surface, the surface of the water, was 102 degrees Fahrenheit. The water in a river where these dolphin creatures lived and then died all at once because of the temperature. We are in a really serious time. The climate is changing. The earth is changing. We have a second planet, Mars, out there that is probably going to take, become another base. There's a base on the moon. We're definitely trying to move off of Earth. But we've got to move off of Earth in that huge, huge, deep compassion of our fellow beings on the Earth. Not to kill, not to bomb, not to knife. It's just stop. Stop violence and switch to compassion and love of each other as fellow beings that extraterrestrials are real extraterrestrials on real planetary systems have been mixing and matching genes and manipulating on this planet for at least 278 million years. I think that's an accurate timeline given to me by a man who worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency for 23 years trying to analyze the motives, the truths, about three competing extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. That was his job. And told me how each one of those three populations of non-humans could disguise each as the other two. Which means without education, without humans understanding, what it means to have a te have a, a technology or technologies that predator change like in the movie shape shifting various changes invisibility in the sky of craft is easy is very easy and on the other side of sh shape changing telepathic control having invisibility, being able to go out QB or warp drive. What would it be like if we finally were introduced publicly to all of the realities of them and there was some sort of global introduction as we, where I started? Every time zone, all at the same time, everything happening live, that we finally have the handshake. Would that handshake, would introducing extraterrestrials who know how to solve a lot of these problems and protect us, would it go in that direction? Would we be a planet that finally had grown up enough to say to advanced extraterrestrials, we need your help. We need your help. On that note, Ian, I'm going to say I truly, I truly extend agape love to every single soul that is here on this planet right now, this second because I personally feel to my core that Homo sapiens sapien is worth
fighting for meaning, for us to go away from all of the craziness and evolve now in a level in which we say we want to be on a planet in which we are all truly helping each other and that making $64 trillion is not the goal. The goal is to be equal and equitable to our fellow human beings. I know this seems like a sad note. I think inside of my heart and my soul, I truly do think we are going to have that introduction, that we will grow up, that we will, humans, end up on these starships with these other beings. And I can only hope and pray that they would be as excited as I would if I were asked to go on a starship and report throughout this universe and other universes all of whatever is changing, manipulating, and going to the heart of a soul cycle program that allows growth throughout infinity, exactly as Roger Penrose said to me in 2018. I'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, Click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. Select a language and the captions will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.